On the review show this week, we're asking if atheism is the new religion. Welcome to the review show. Is there a new crusade against faith? Tonight, we're looking at controversial new books and a film which critique and satirize religion. And as the Catholic Church comes under attack, it's almost a sign that atheists are now in the ascendant. Philip Pullman's new book reimagines the New Testament with faked miracles and a phony resurrection. Is he setting out to offend or to convert? It's a good thing to be attacked. Jesus said so. We'll review David Bedil's film, The Infidel. I'm Jewish! And we've read a new American novel which attacks 36 arguments for the existence of God. It's all about inhabiting points of view that, uh, um, and that's, that's really what fiction is about. With me are Peter Hitchens, whose new book explains how he refound his faith. The Reverend Richard Coles, Mona Siddiqui, professor of Islamic studies at Glasgow University, and the comedian Robin Ince, whose stand-up material is all about why we shouldn't believe. And later we'll hear from self-proclaimed evangelical atheist Brian Eno about his cultural week, plus a tribute to the late Malcolm McLaren from the jazz group Polar Bear. So first tonight, we turn to Philip Pullman's controversial new book. He was inspired to write it by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but many Christians have already condemned it. The good man Jesus and the scoundrel Christ reimagines the New Testament, with Mary giving birth to twin boys, Jesus and Christ. Jesus is a charismatic preacher with a revolutionary moral code who comes to doubt the existence of God. Christ, his twin, is a more troubled, weaker character who writes down the teaching of Jesus, but deliberately distorts them for posterity. In the Pullman Gospel, Mary isn't a virgin, the Christian miracles have a rational explanation, and the resurrection is a fake. Let's hear from Philip Pullman before we discuss the many ideas in his book. This is the story of Jesus and his brother Christ, of how they were born, of how they lived, and of how one of them died. The death of the other is not part of the story. I thought it would be interesting to explore the dual nature that's expressed in the name Jesus Christ. And the idea came to me of, of treating them as two separate individuals, twin boys, uh, very different characters. One, the active, charismatic preacher who is um, full of power and conviction. And the other character, the Christ, who is an observer, uh, a self-conscious, thoughtful, um, tortured, self-aware um, individual. And was this a way of explaining how stories come to be told, or is this an attack on Christian faith in the stories of the Bible? It's not an attack on anything. I'd be a fool to attack Christian faith. It's a mistake, I think, to engage directly with passionate believers. You're not going to change their minds at all. Um, and I'm not interested in doing that, really. I was interested in telling a story. It is a myth. Um, I treat it as something that I have the right to talk about as much as I have the right to talk about it to tell if I wanted to tell the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, it's common cultural property. It belongs to us all. So I had no sense that I was um, trampling on someone else's sacred garden or that I needed special permission. It belongs to me. It belongs to everyone. Is it disingenuous, though, to describe this as a story like any other, given its subject matter, which will be very offensive to many Christians? Offense. Um... I don't think anybody has the right to live without being offended. So if you set out to shock? No. Um, no. But, I, but in telling this story, I knew I probably would shock. But the, I, I didn't write it to shock. That wasn't the purpose. How do people deal with offence? Well, it seems to me the, the far the wisest way to deal with offence is to ignore it. Well, it might not be. People might think that some of your ideas may actually catch on, as it were. I mean, you, you take one of the ideas in the book, it attacks one of the central tenets of Christianity, which is the resurrection itself. You, in effect, say this was a con. The Gospels themselves are very interesting about the resurrection. 
uh, none of them describe it. We never see the resurrection taking place. We only come, we only go with the, uh, with the women. Is it one woman? Or is it two women? Or is it three women? The counts differ. The, the, the resurrection is nowhere presented as, a, as an established fact that, ever, that, that has witnesses. You seem to have particular criticisms for the institution of the church itself. Yeah. Jesus is, is very critical of, of what will become uh, the church down through the ages and touches on the current crisis that, that we're seeing in the Catholic Church. Well, he does in the Gospels. He refers to the Pharisees as, uh, as, as, as whited sepulchres, you know, painted tombs, neat and clean outside but full of corruption and mold within. Uh, that's what happens. When you get anybody um, wielding any sort of authority, as Jesus said in my book, whether it's in a household or a village or in Rome itself, um, and he declares that he's doing everything he does because of God, because God gives him the right to do it, inevitably corruption will follow. Inevitably things will go rotten. Inevitably the whole thing will go bad and stink of corruption. Any priest who wants to indulge his secret appetites, his greed, his lust, his cruelty, will find himself like a wolf in a field of lambs where the shepherd is bound and gagged and blinded. No one will even think of questioning the rightness of what this holy man does in private, and his little victims will cry to heaven for pity. Do you think there has been a kind of shift in intellectual life in Britain that atheists have found a new voice? Uh, maybe so, but I don't think there's a school of atheism. I don't think there's a, um, a concerted band of militant people who go about waving banners saying, behead all those who believe in God. Do you think this is a book which could have been written about Islam, could have had this similar kind of attacks on the Quran? Well, no, I couldn't have written it because I don't know anything about Islam. I don't, I don't come from that tradition. I can write about Christianity because it's in the very marrow of my bones. Christianity made me and formed every, um, every, every, every thought I have and the way I think and formulate things is, is because of, is, is, is owing to my Christian education. And I don't reject that. I, I, I embrace it warmly. It made me what I am. Now, Peter, Philip Pullman there was adamant that he wasn't trampling on anybody's sacred garden, but did you see it as an attack on Christian beliefs? Well, we know that it is, because he once said, before he became famous, these words, I am trying to undermine the basis of Christian belief. What he also says, very interestingly, is that once upon a time is a much more effective way of getting a message across than thou shalt not. He knows what he's doing, and I think what also was apparent from that interview was his, his near fury when he was going through that passage in which he manages to predict a child sex abuse by the church, it seems to me. Uh, and his near fury against the church, as if the church mandated child sex abuse, or as if it didn't take place in liberal secular institutions as well. There's a real anger, it seems to me, apparent in, in, in him about the Christian religion, and what I want to know is what the source of it is. Richard, do you see it as undermining Christian belief? No, I think if, if that's what he's trying to do, I have to say my faith, and I read it very closely and with enjoyment, survived intact. Um, but I think there's something disingenuous, actually, to use a coin of phrase, about what he's doing, in that he draws this distinction between Jesus Christ, the enigmatic teacher, the defender of the poor, the, the man who saves the woman taken in adultery, the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount, and the Christ of faith, the resurrected Christ, the transfigured Christ, lit up like a Christmas tree, endorsed from heaven, as if the one is authentic, and the other is a sort of later edition. But both those are present in the Gospels, which only came about a generation after the events they describe. So the enigmatic Jesus is just as much, in fact, the creation of the institutional church as the Jesus of faith. And I don't think that's dealt with at all. I think that's not convenient for his purposes. Do you understand, Robin, why some people might take offence at this? I think it's very silly to take offence to this, because I think it's an interesting retelling of the story. Uh, I, I've often found that the most interesting retellings of the story are the ones that have been the most controversial, but have probably been the closest to, if anything, 
thing, making me believe more in, in Jesus, the myth of Jesus, etc. When, when uh, Last Temptation of Christ and Son of Man by, by Dennis Potter were at the time railed against, and yet they create both a very exciting human Jesus, but also a very powerful message. And I, I found from reading this book that, it again, brought me back to my childhood. I, I found that the Sermon on the Mount, even though it's quite close to a book I, I read written in the 60s in San Francisco called God is for Real Man, you know, it does become quite <laughs> colloquial, but I felt that it, it was a powerful message. And I know that it's an attack on, the, the, on organized religion, which, as Philip Pullman said, is actually something which is attacked in the Bible itself. But I actually felt that the message was, was really strong in this book. Do you feel the essential moral Christian message was still in the book? I think so. I actually found the book really quite spiritual to read. Once you take away the underlying message of institutional religion can be corrupt and institutional religion takes away from the original message or the vision of a prophet or a seer, I actually found passages extremely moving. So as somebody outside the Christian faith reading that, I was thinking, how, not necessarily how would a Christian feel reading this, but actually what is it telling me about the way I think about God? Spiritual what? moving? Um, no, uh, mean and spiteful, I would have thought, rather more. And oh, okay. and it's actually, not mean and actually, spiteful. It's extremely mean and spiteful. It's Why also, it it's also rather spiteful? badly written. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is, is, is written with the blunt end of a bread pudding. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful passage in the authorised version of the Bible. And as Pullman writes, it, it reads as if it's been crafted by the Department of Health and Social Security. Uh, the, 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 the amazing, one of the amazing things about the Pullman industry is the way in which he is, he, he's treated now as a kind of national event. When he appears in public, he has to be accompanied by the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> uh, and, yet, and yet the style of the book is, uh, and I noticed that, uh, that, that he, he, was, he was reading the New English Bible before he read it. It's very reminiscent of that, which is sort of halfway between Enoch Powell and EastEnders it's in it's style. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it, and, and can, can I just get one point over with? It's not a question of being offended. I'm not offended by this, uh, nor, do, nor do my objections to it mean that I want to have it banned. But I do think we should recognize that it is propaganda and it's intended to reach particularly the minds of the, the, the unformed minds of the young, on whom Mr. Pullman concentrates most of his efforts. Richard, it's propaganda, if it is propaganda, as, as, as Peter says, but it says that the resurrection, you know, the central tenet of, of, of your religion, was a con. Well, hardly the first to do that. I mean, Thomas Jefferson did it almost exactly the same way about 200 years ago. And go back to the Gnostic Gospels of the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century. I mean, all of them are but people... how can you are... find that enjoyable to read? Well, because I, I just think it's fascinating, actually. And, and I'm more encouraged that people like Philip Pullman or indeed others who would perhaps describe themselves more readily as new atheists are engaging with this. The enemy seems to me not to be Philip Pullman. It's indifference. I think we're talking about religion as a result of these books, and I think we're talking about how we understand stories, even if you don't think it's a great, uh, it, it has a spiritual message, I think as a, as a work of fiction, and it says on the back, this is a story, whatever that's supposed to mean, I think it's a, a very interesting p work to read just as a work of fiction, and of course it has images and it takes you back to the Bible, that's the whole basis, but I think just as a work of fiction, I found it really quite interesting. Okay, so there are 2,000 years of history to this, you know, Christianity is a very substantial system, it's not something that I feel is sort of threatened or shaken by the interest of Philip Pullman or uh, Christopher Hitchens, big computer, or, or Richard Dawkins. On well, the contrary, absolutely. I think it's a sign of its strength, a measure of its strength and its well, endurance. By Peter. itself not, but there is a tide of, of secularism in our society at the moment. Some of it is official, a codes of practice demanding that people support uh, uh, equality and diversity. Uh, in public life, which actually make it, 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 which dethrone the Christian religion as the as the basic religion of the country, and a very considerable attack on the teaching of religion as truth to children, which is growing in pace, which I describe in my book at some length, with people actually calling for the prevention of, of, of parents teaching uh, children religion as truth. This is, this is not a minor thing, and Pullman is a part of it. And we have to recognize that, there is a, that the secularists are no longer content with just being accepted in society. They actually now want to change society and is push religion out of the Is there a proselytizing turn about I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I, I think this is all nonsense. I, I think the idea, first of all, the idea of, of Christianity being dethroned. We see so many of these willy-nilly whining Christian things about some nurse who's not allowed to wear her crucifix as it's sold to us, but it's not a nurse who's not allowed to wear a crucifix, 
It's a woman who's not allowed to wear a necklace because she's a nurse, and nurses aren't allowed to wear jewellery. And I think there's a lot of, of, of whining and whinging going on, which doesn't make the Christian church look very impressive. I think what Philip Pullman has done, anyone who approaches that book is not just going to read that book and then go, well, that's Jesus done with. If anything, they may well then go really? to the Gospels. Okay. They may well read other religious writers as well as non-religious writers. And I think to feel in any way threatened by this book and, and to, I always like occasionally agreeing with the vicar, I think that's the thing is there's a strength in a religion, but why do we take it back to the important philosophies? I mean, when we look at the B&B &B thing, and we, the supposed most important tenet of, of Christianity is that you must never have two gays in your house. Well, make sure you don't have a prawn cocktail as well. You know, there, I, I think we need to look at the important parts about, which are about humanity and kindness, and I feel that Pullman's book did the, get that across. But one of the problems when we talk about, and we're doing it again, is we're looking at, as if there's a secularist camp and there's a believer's camp, as if A, that these two camps are monolithic and that they have nothing to say to each other and our deepest human concerns traverse each other's boundaries and there's a lot of conversation going on so to even look at well what does as you say there's this kind of secularist wave I don't buy that for one minute do you, do you think a similar exercise could have been done with the Quran would you have been happy for Philip Pullman to have done the same thing I think it's one thing to say that people haven't dealt with the Quran in ways that have made people think about the veracity and the truth and the divine origin but I think it's another thing to say in contemporary times would somebody take the Quran, take stories, transmorph them into something different and come out. And I mean, I suppose the closest analogy I could point, point to would be what if somebody d said the Quran actually um, doesn't exist in the way that we think. It's all Muhammad's making. It's not divine in origin. And construed a story around that. I think from my own immediate thinking, that would probably be the closest analogy to somebody saying, what have you done to Islam's holy scripture? Just imagine a book about Islam in which the word scoundrel Absolutely was no. uh, in the title. It just wouldn't happen. And I think that's one of the reasons why I say it's, it, it's mean and spiteful. You could, you could retell this story in many different ways. But the ridiculous use of the, of, of the word Christ, which is a title, not a name, as a second name, the invention of a non-existent twin, and, and the insertion of this word scoundrel in the title is a courting of controversy and, 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 a, and a deliberate one, and a, a one designed to make people angry. But that's the interesting thing, is I found he wasn't... The, uh, the, he's the angry is himself. slightly weird, because he he's not about? a scoundrel Christ, is he? In the actual... But he's he's oh, misled. Yes. And he's, he's, he's I don't Judas. think he's a scoundrel, though. He's Judas. Ju you know, Ju okay. Judas has become part of Christ in this story. OK, well, we move on now, because the good man Jesus and the scoundrel Christ is out now. And another atheist has targeted religion this week. David Baddiel's new film comedy, Infidel, is about a Muslim who finds out that he was adopted and was, in fact, born a Jew. Baddiel thinks that in recent times, because of political correctness, people have been wary about making jokes about religion, Islam in particular. The Jewish Muslim Mahmoud, played by Omar Jalili, embarks on a journey to find out more about his Jewish heritage with the help of an American taxi driver, played by Richard Sheaf from the West Wing. So is the infidel a simple British comedy or so offensive that it could provoke a fatwa, as some newspapers have suggested? I've been talking about that to David Baddiel himself. Your film's a comedy, so you obviously want people to laugh at it, but is there any kind of wider purpose as well? My starting project, to some extent, with a, a comedy about race and religion is to try and do jokes that the main character and the family around him are kind of an everyman, flawed, nice, engaging, klutzy figure and not defined by their political or religious conviction. Were you worried about causing any offence to Muslim audiences? Um, not when I was writing it. Well, I, I can't really write and second-guess what the reaction might be, otherwise you'd just be crippled as a writer. Obviously, once I'd finished it, and particularly once it started getting out there, the first question that was asked is, oh, will there be a fatwa about this and whatever? If you actually look at the history of fatwa or the history of those things, they are about the actual degradation as perceived by those people who get angry about it of the objects of faith. So those are essentially Muslim versions of, say, Jerry Springer, the opera or whatever, where something that is held to be holy or sacred is actually degraded or made fun of. Now, this movie doesn't actually do that. This movie is about, it's a culture clash comedy, it's about prejudice and stereotypes and people. But did you set any kind of limits on yourself? Not because you were worried about a fatwa, but because you were concerned about causing offence. Did you think, right, I'm going to cut out that joke, for example? <sighs> I didn't really. I mean, I, I didn't really worry about that too much. I mean, now, 
there is obviously some comedy made that is designed to shock and designed to offend or whatever, and that can be really great too. But just this, that wasn't really the project of this film, really. In my mind, it is kind of, and people might disagree with this, but in my mind, it's kind of more radical and more subversive in a way to try and make a kind of mainstream feel-good comedy. Is there a risk that people will laugh for racist reasons in the same way that some people used to laugh at Alf Garnett? We've got to a point now in culture where if a character in a drama or a comedy is racist, then that's the end of that character. You know you're not supposed to be sympathetic to that character, but in this movie, you are. You're meant to stick with them. I mean, I kind of think the whole movie is so obviously coming from not a place of, of racism, not a place of hate, that I don't imagine that a racist would go along and, and laugh at the movie, and certainly they'd be disappointed. <laughs> Robin, what did you make of this film? Do you think in any way it's likely to stir up a fatwa? I think only if people haven't seen the film. Do you know, it's almost not about religion at all. It's, as David Baddiel said, it, it's, it's basically a kind of a body swap. Someone has to swap their life comedy. It's about... Uh, I, I mean, Ahmed Jalili's bosom is so marginally Muslim. He, he spends more time going, she's got smashing knockers, or whatever it is, but I'm using on the buses talk there, obviously, <laughs> uh, and watching MTV and, and his Jewish friend played by Richard Schiff, who's, who's actually fantastic in the film, uh, is kind of busier getting drunk. So it's actually two people who are very mildly culturally uh, religious. So I, I don't think, and in fact, if anything, I would like them to have gone a little bit further. I would like to have either seen a film in which someone who had defined their life as a Muslim suddenly found out they'd been born Jewish, or possibly that the two lead characters actually had to end up going on some road trip to Israel and the occupied territory, something which confronted those issues a little bit more. Do you more. think it could have gone further? But isn't that the point, that if, even if he's mildly Muslim, it's not till he finds out that actually he was of a different race, of different religion, that suddenly his religion starts to matter, and who he is starts to matter. And I think that's the real twist in it. And I actually, I, at the end of the film, I thought about this. What if I found out I was adopted and of a different race or a different religion. And I actually felt quite uncomfortable thinking about that. Did you? That's yes. interesting. Yeah. How would I go about this? And would I do what Omid Jalili does in trying to be a Jew for a while and see how that feels? Um, for the only thing I didn't like was the ending. I thought that was slightly contrived and a bit too merry and happy, as if suddenly all you need to do is read a few passages of scripture and everything falls into place. Well, what did you think, Peter, about this idea of discovering having a different ancestry? Well, I, as it happens, uh, when I was about 33, I discovered that I have Jewish ancestry. Not I, I, under the Third Reich's laws, I would have been something called a Mischlingsweiter Grad, a half-breed, second class, so not murdered, just discriminated against. It was an interesting discovery. But it didn't throw me into some kind of turmoil or panic. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I'm, I'll, I, I can live with that. It didn't alter the fact that I was a Christian, nor need it. Uh, Judaism as a religion is not, is, is not inherited. You'd have to be obsessed with it to think that. Well. But as a construct for a comedy, did you think that worked? I thought it ran out of steam, actually. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I agree with you, actually. I, I, thought, I, I thought it was kind of funny. I didn't think it was a film about religion at all. And that was confirmed at the end when all of a sudden it, there was a sort of bit of a sister act knees up. And it was as if, come on, everybody, if only we could just all acknowledge our common humanity, knock your heads together, heavens to Betsy, we'd all get on fine. And it reminded me of that musical, The Beautiful Game, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Ben Elton, which suggested that sectarianism in Northern Ireland could be salved by playing football. Actually, football seems to me to exacerbate sectarianism, really. And I think with this film, it, it seems to me that actually if you really want to get to grips with how uh, people of different faiths might live together, constructively, imaginatively, creatively, it's not through eliding difference, it's actually through the exploration of difference. And I thought that's where this film didn't pay off. Doesn't it explore difference to the extent that the two characters, uh, the, the, the Muslim and the Jewish taxi driver, trade stereotypes, trade mm. racist jokes, and things like people of the checkbook with each other? I think, if anything, I, I would like to have seen more of that odd couple relationship, because I think that was the strongest part of the film. And there are, in the first 20 minutes as well there's some cracking jokes in it but there was a, a lovely a, a nice setup between Richard Chief and and Omid Jalili and then I think yes it was uh, that was the problem I think especially with Four Lions Chris Morris's film about to come out about four knockabout kind of terrorists mm -hmm. I think that's going to have raised not necessarily raised the game but taken the issue in a different direction but I, I, I would like to have seen it go a little bit further I think maybe everything to the casual viewer remains still most of the characters on quite a stereotypical level. Do you think that it goes right to say that there has been a reticence about treating some of these subjects in comedy? Well, I suppose there has to be, isn't it? Because some of them just aren't funny. I'm not entirely sure this film is particularly funny myself, but I, 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 why shouldn't there be a reticence about, about dealing with some things in comedy? They're too serious. I don't, I, I don't see why everything has to be subject to comedy. 
I don't know, I, I like the idea of laughing gently at furious fundamentalists, encouraging gentle laughter at furious fundamentalists. I think that might be quite a healthy thing to but do. But I suppose what's different about this, what David Baddiel was saying there, is that, he, I mean, look, there is an extremist preacher in it, but the central family was a very, you know, inverted commas, mainstream Muslim family. Mainstream Muslim. And I think, actually, for a lot of Muslims, mainstream Muslims living in the UK, whether they thought it was funny or not, they would see scenes in there they would recognise. They would hear lines in there they would recognise. Especially not just in the Jewish Muslim jokes and the Jewish Muslim stereotypes, but the very fact that the girl's father is a fundamentalist. Okay, he's a fraud as well, but he's an extremist who's sitting there this pretending the to be the, the, the stepfather. And so fundamentalism doesn't just become confined to a political issue. It's very much a real thing on people's couches and people's living rooms, and ordinary families have to deal with that as well. I thought it was quite true. That even though it is just like a fun, jolly film, according to the Independence Day, as yet they haven't managed to get a distributor in Israel. Now, of course, that may well be spin because it's the day the film comes out, but still interesting. Well, interesting you say that because we actually can see a scene now in which we can see David Baddiel satirising the Jewish faith perhaps even more than he does Muslims. So. <laughs> Do you think, Robin, the way that it's easier, perhaps particularly for David Baddiel, who is you know, of Jewish ancestry himself, but to satirise Judaism than it is to look at uh, Muslims? I don't know. I, th I think there's a fine balance between the two because there obviously is, uh, in the Western world, there's a certain level of persecution to both. So you have to go through a thin line to make sure that you don't in any way incite people. And in fact, I did feel that the, the Muslim kind of, uh, the, the heavy in it, they, they did give one of them a hook hand. And I thought it was a great pity that they didn't go further with that. They only had one dunking biscuit thing. I think if you're going to go as far <laughs> as having the stereotype of there's always going to be one with a hook hand, then really use that hook for a little bit more slapstick. You did struggle a bit with this teacup, though. Yeah. The teacup no. and the biscuit were fine, but I want to. If I see someone spend a lot of money making a hook, you know, for a film, I want to see that hook used more. Did you enjoy that? I actually did find bits a bit very funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I, did, I think it was a bit too long, and I think some of the scenes went on far too long, especially when Omi Jalili is trying to discover how to become the good Jew and look like the good Jew. But I did find a lot of it very funny because I think a lot of these things, although they're stereotypes, they do touch at the hearts of these communities. And I suppose stereotypes are at the heart of a lot of humour. I suppose they are. I just couldn't wait for it to end. Why was that? Look, I just thought it was terrible. It was embarrassing to watch. OK. Well, The Infidel opened at cinemas today. There certainly seems to be a trend for atheists to be writing about religion. A new novel, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, a work of fiction, which has created waves in the United States, deals with the psychology of religion. It's written by philosopher Rebecca Goldstein. She and her husband, Stephen Pinker, have been dubbed the brainiest couple in America. Its protagonist is a young professor who writes a bestseller about faith and ends up being dubbed the atheist with a soul. Cass Seltzer dissects the arguments which are often used to prove God's existence, but although an atheist himself, he believes that religion answers deep human needs. Before we discuss why atheists are taking on religious ideas, let's hear from Rebecca Goldstein. <laughs> There have been some very famous atheists recently. Everybody knows what that kind of atheist is like. I thought it would be interesting to present a different sort. For close to two decades, Cass Seltzer has all but owned the psychology of religion, but only because nobody else wanted it. But now things had happened, fundamental and fundamentalist things, and religion as a phenomenon is on everybody's mind. There are certain philosophical questions about which people deeply disagree, that reveal entirely different ori orientations towards the world. They're really experiencing the world very differently. And um, it's hard to grasp what the other person isn't seeing, because they're seeing everything differently. This particular debate uh, between reason and religion, uh, where everybody seemed to be downgrading uh, and dismissing the other side, that's something that fiction can get into. It's all about inhabiting points of view. Cassett started out with all the standard arguments for God's existence, the ones discussed in philosophy classes and textbooks. But then he had gone beyond these, too. He had tried to capture under the net of analytic reason those fleeting shadows cast by unseen winged things darting through the thick foliage of the religious sensibility. So Cass goes after 
the arguments for the existence of God uh, in a very thorough way. And yet he thinks that religion is about far more than simply the belief in God's existence. And he's convinced that you can destroy those arguments for God's existence and people will still hold on to religion, and not stupidly, uh, not because they're idiots and they can't follow it, but because religion answers to so many needs, and uh, you know, including expressing that existence is just such a tremendous thing. Richard, this is unashamedly a novel of ideas. I suppose one of the central themes is that even if you can uh, destroy the arguments for God, for religion, through logic, there's still a, a deep human need, a need in the community to have religion. There seems to be a lot of evidence for that now, but I, mean, I have to say that religion for me does not begin with considering the ontological argument, although I had to do it when I did my theology degree, but I've never thought about it, I have to say, since. It doesn't begin, it begins with a, well for me as a Christian, it begins with the perception that in Jesus Christ, the sum of human cruelty and darkness is answered definitively in a way that makes new life possible. That's where it begins for me. Everything else is kind of secondary to that. So I mean, I enjoyed this book. It was nice to revisit some of the arguments for the existence of God. But again, if it was intended, and I don't think it was, uh, you know, to sort of undermine or to challenge or to persuade me away from that, it didn't touch it. it, it you know, it wasn't, it was like prescribing an aspirin for a broken leg. It didn't, you know, work. But I suppose, in a sense, and I think this is shown in, in a debate, a set-piece debate towards the end of the book between a believer and non-believer, it is saying that there's, a, there's a, a, a dichotomy between atheism and religion. Yeah, well, to be honest, I'm going to have to admit that I found the book very confusing uh, because I didn't know whether it was a novel initially or whether it was a kind of Sophie's World-style guide to uh, religious philosophy. And then in the middle of the book, there's quite an interesting plot, I found, set in this, uh, this, this Jewish... Uh, town called Walden, where there's a rabbi and there's an interesting mix of mysticism and uh, mathematics and prime numbers, and I'm a martyr to that kind of thing. And then it went back into the debate. And, and the hardest thing that I found is, n never mind the dichotomy between religion and, uh, and, and science and rationalism and all of these myths, uh, the thing that I found was nearly every character who worked at this university, I would just go, what an awful person. What a <laughs> reprehensible world this world of intelligentsia must be, because yeah. everyone was so self involved. No one seemed to be, with possibly the exception of Cass, that actually that interest, and maybe his friend Ross, no one seemed that interested actually in the world beyond, I've worked out this, this is my idea. And even the, the final debate I found, again, maybe it would have been better if I just read the transcript of, or perhaps a debate you've had, you know, Peter, when, when you and your brother d debate these things, oh, that was the kind of one, thing. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of um, well, I thought, one of the things I felt was that it was insufferably smug. And I think that the, one of the things that, that she said in the interview, uh, there was a debate between religion and reason, as if there was no reason on the side of religion. Like all these people who say, oh, well, science has proved that God doesn't exist. Because, I, because of science, there's no, there's, there's no need for religion. This extraordinary belief that the, the matter is resolved and that every, all the right is on one side. And although she said that she didn't think religious people were stupid, it certainly seemed to me in the book that she does think religious people. And is that what stupid. we're seeing at the moment, Mona, that this kind of at least attempted polarization? I think there is. I think what, what these kind of books and the current debates are having about religion and reason or religion and science is that our vocabulary has been reduced. We're talking about things as right and wrong, proving and disproving, and actually most people of faith do not think about religion, as you say, in these ways, oh, have I been able to prove the existence of God and should I believe in such a way? It's a way of making the world comprehensible to you. It's a way of giving meaning to your life, and it's a way of sustaining you. So are, I, you, I, I, sorry. are you a part of this in a sense because your, your act is very much decrying religion, isn't it? No. That was a lie. That was a lie you said at the beginning. Uh, what my, the stuff that I, I like to talk about is actually a celebration of science, which is different to... I actually deliberately avoid attacking religion, because I think also if you have what any kind carols of... carols for godless people? Well, Nine Lessons of Carols for Godless People, foolishly retitled Nerdstock by BBC Four, uh, was 
is actually, or nearly all scientists and comedians who love science, talking about pulsars and images from the Hubble telescope, because I think if you, if you are going to get to a world where I personally believe is more rational, where we don't need to keep clutching onto a kind of mystical cloak, that's going to be when you do go, are there 200 billion or 400 but billion stars in this galaxy? Assumes, it just assumes that people of faith or people of religion, at least the world's big religions are not interested in science. No, it doesn't. Or that science is have, some kind of affront to their faith. We have religious people coming as well. So this is not... One of the main things that I deliberately do is say we mustn't attack religion because I don't want people who are religious, and we do get quite a few people in the audience who are religious, feeling that they're going to be offended by the show. Just every show. just don't want to insult your granny. No, I, 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 mean, why, because I don't see the point in attacking religion. I don't see the point in going, this bit of the Bible's rubbish and the idea of believing in God is foolish. I think the, the way to, to go into another direction is to celebrate the incredible nature of, of discovery, the amazing genetic code enormous, that is inside each one of us. Well, it's far more interesting. Well, the enormous impact that Christianity has made to, through the Renaissance, through the Enlightenment, through all kinds of things, to the scientific project. That seems to me to be a much more interesting thing. Oh, well, there's an interesting the, the, well, thing there. There's also a the nice styming of the scientific project. I mean, don't, you know, we, there are certain people who've been burnt at stakes and, and Galileo incarcerated sure. and other things. So, so I, I, don't, I think some of Christian history has been slightly rewritten. There's a, I mean, when I watched Anne Widdicombe's program about the Ten Commandments, where it seemed to be, until Christianity existed, it appears there was no morality at all. Everyone was just killing and raping. Do, I've checked in history, it appears that's wrong. Uh, Peter, I mean, do you sense that there, you, I think you've written about this, that there's, there is a sense of a new militant secularism, a new, more aggressive form of atheism? It's very aggressive. And it's, it's filled with, with rage and, and anger and intolerance. And it, it's quite striking when you, when you read these people's works just how much, how much fury and intolerance there is in them. And I, one of the things they never say uh, is why is it they're so anxious, except for there's a very interesting atheist philosopher called Thomas Nagel. Uh, who does actually go into this, they never actually say, why is it are they so anxious for there not to be a god? And why does it matter to them so much that there shouldn't be a god? Why do they insist? I, I, I can say I believe well, that there is a god. The, the atheists say there isn't a god and I hate him. Uh, and no, I don't uh, think uh, that, 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 there is more and more of that um, coming, coming into the public sphere and more and more of a desire say, to push R religion. Right. I think you might be bringing your, your, your brother's work is probably the most furious of we those books in that, that section. <laughs> but uh, of Christopher Hitchens, Hitchens, God, God, is, God, is, this, God yes. is Not Great, which had the, the terrible title in America of How Religion Poisons Everything, which is certainly <laughs> going to woo people over, I imagine. But I actually think that what people like Richard Dawkins and, and, and Daniel Dennett and then earlier on, people who didn't have an atheist agenda but did have a rational agenda, people like Carl Sagan and Richard Feynman, is the worry is not about religion when it is being a good thing, it is the worry that when we see things like intelligent design and creationism creeping back in, when we see the stymieing of progress, that's when it becomes a problem. And I mean, if there is a boom in atheism, uh, and I don't even like the idea of, 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 of saying that, but basically what happened in 2001, I think this all happened after 911. This, this was a, where... I, mean, I think but what's so rarely conceded by the more militant atheists, I think, is the idea that there's anything that, that good that comes out of, well, institutional religion at all. But then you want to say, what about the work of the Anglican Church in South Africa in the fight mm. against apartheid? Okay. What about liberation theologians in Latin America? Or what about just the day-by-day -day presence of the uh, Church of England in parishes, taking care of the elderly, visiting the sick, trying to stitch okay. together the fabric mm. of a fraying community? Here end this, this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> in a moment, the jazz outfit Polar Bear will play us out, but first here's a cultural take on the week from another musical legend. Brian Eno is curating this year's Brighton Festival, which includes a piece of his art with religious overtones, despite his claims to be an evangelical atheist. Here's his guide to that work, plus some of his hot tips. This piece is called 77 Million Paintings, but that's only on one screen. When there are three sets of screens like this, it's 77 million cubed, which is a very big number and would take longer than the age of the universe to see. I think that one of the things one wants from an artwork is the feeling of losing one's very small sense of oneself. I think one of the things you want is to be reminded that you're part of something bigger. And some people would think that's a religious experience. I, I think it's also a, an experience of intoxication and sex as well, actually. I'm here not only to show this piece, but to curate part of the Brighton Festival, um, which means that I get the luxurious position of putting together some concerts I would love to see. I love a cappella singing. And I have Reggie Watts, who's a sort of comedian, genius, 
The Persuasions, who are one of the oldest working a cappella bands, and Naturally Seven, who are one of the newest and most astonishing. I read a lot because I don't watch television. I've just been reading a new book by David Shields called Reality Hunger, which is a very interesting format for a book in that it's, it's largely unattributed quotes. But I went to see The Hurt Locker and thought it was worthless propaganda. Last night I watched on a channel called WikiLeaks, which you may know, a 38-minute film taken from a helicopter gunship and it's much, much, much more alarming than Hurt Locker. Thanks to all my guests for playing us out tonight. Our two members of the jazz outfit Polar Bear. They'll be riffing on a track from their latest album, Peepers. See if you can suss out their subtle reference to the Sex Pistols in tribute 